Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello. Uh, Pierre-Joseph Proudhon famously declared property is theft, and perhaps more surprisingly, that anarchy is order. Speaking in 1840, he was the first self-proclaimed anarchist. Anarchy comes from the Greek word anarchos, meaning without rulers, and the movement draws on the ideas of philosophers like William Godwin and John Locke. It's also evident in Taoism, Buddhism, and in other religions. In Christianity, for example, St. Paul said, there's no authority except God. The anarchist rejection of a ruling class inspired Peter Krop- Kropotkin, a Russian Russian prince and leading anarcho-communist, to utter this rousing cry in 1897. Either the state forever, crushing individual and local life, or the destruction of states and new life starting again, on the principles of the lively initiative of the individual and groups and that of free agreement. The choice lies with you. He identified some examples of anarchism in action, including the Lifeboat Association. In the Spanish Civil War, anarchists embarked on the biggest experiment to date in organising society along anarchist principles. Although it ultimately failed, it wasn't without successes along the way. So why has anarchism become synonymous with chaos and disorder? What factors came together to make the 19th century and early 20th century the high point for its ideas? Joining me are Peter Marshall, philosopher and historian, John Keane, professor of politics at Westminster University, and Ruth Kinner, senior lecturer in politics at Loughborough University. John Keane... When the word anarchy, when was the word first used in English to describe someone's political stance, and why did it appear then? It's it's it, it's a word that finds its way into English in the middle of the 16th century, and it's synonymous with the absence of government, with lawlessness, with disorder. Milton, for example, in Paradise Lost, refers to the waste-wide anarchy of chaos. What's remarkable is that this meaning still survives until today, but roughly at the end of the 18th century, it undergoes a change of meaning uh, so that it becomes a a wholly positive term. Anarchy stands for the uh, self-discipline and self-imposed rules uh, among individuals. They have no... uh, They don't don't, uh, stand for uh, uh, organised government over them. Uh, That brute engine was the way that Godwin described all government... They are hostile to parties. Uh, The old anarchist slogan that if voting could change anything, they'd abolish it is uh, redolent of that. The rejection of all false gods, for example, organised, institutionalised religions. Uh, The opposition to uh, the wages system, wage labour, markets. The strong sense among uh, uh, anarchists, all seen as positive, as uh, individualism... Uh, self-imposed uh, judgments, reason, means that anarchy uh, and anarchism came from the end of the 18th century to be associated with cooperation, with love, uh, with, uh, for example, mutual aid. And I would say as well it's important to see that, that the tradition of anarchism came to be associated, and it has a prescience today, because of its Uh, identification with nature, with the simplicity of nature, with uh, the closeness to nature. So just as uh, societies, industrialised societies, dominate nature and have destroyed parts of nature, anarchists object that this uh, is a reason for, so to say, standing in defence of nature. Well, that's a terrific overview. We, we won't stop the programme then. We're still, we're now, we're still going for the next uh, 40 odd minutes to try to sort of uh, spread it out a little bit, John. The, can we go back to uh, why it was used? You've mentioned Milton, but, was, but as I understand, it might have been used in the Civil War uh, by the royalists of their opponents. Can you just give us a, a, a note on that? Yes, I, I mean, the word anarchism uh, first enters the English language uh, in 1642, at the point at which... Uh, the, the the royal estate uh, is in collapse and the beginning there is the beginning of rebellion and the word anarchist also appears in this period not surprisingly because it is a term uh, of abuse used uh, principally by royalists to describe those who are fermenting disorder so basically it is used by people who have the control of society against those who seek to overthrow them in English from the beginning that is its first use Yes, They will not see them as opposing a different sort of society. They see them as merely destructive and therefore to be got rid of. Yes, and uh, it's this chaos, this uh, 
uh, waste-wide anarchy of chaos, as, as Milton calls it, which uh, generates enormous fear among the defenders of, um, of the monarchy. So, in a sense, you sort of demonise them instead of explaining them or, or taking them intellectually seriously by throwing this word at them and sort of fudging, spluttering, uh, obscuring the issues. But at this point uh, in time, there are no anarchists in the positive uh, late 18th century sense. No, we, that comes later, and it's associated, I think, with the French Revolution. We're sliding towards that. Yep. We will get there in, at about uh, quarter past nine. Uh, Ruth Kenner, it's generally been a term, as, as, as John said, of, of, of abuse associated with chaos and, uh, and even ungodliness. Can, you, can we develop that a bit, why, why that was the case? Well, for, I mean, the anarchists argue that it's, it's a prejudice, um, and if that's so, I think it's a, it's a fairly deep-seated one. I mean, in the history of ideas, it's, um, I think there are two challenges that anarchists have to face. One is the idea that uh, if you don't have law, you can't have virtue, which is a sort of Machiavellian notion that if you leave people by their own devices, then they tend to be uh, lazy and corrupt. And so what you need to give them purpose is a strong leader uh, who will bring out the best in them and raise them to virtue. So it comes out of a notion of human beings, of humankind, as being like that. And so I, well, that's, one, that's mm. one part of it. I mean, the other part of it is the sort of the Hobbesian um, yeah. challenge that the, the anarchists face, and that's the idea that um, where you have self-interested individuals who have different moral uh, codes, it, and no one to arbitrate between them, what will happen is that they are necessarily drawn into conflict with each other. Uh, they can't resolve that conflict, and so they live a life of, of constant insecurity and fear. And the only way out of that is to um, create an authority who will literally lay down the law, um, establish you know, what is right and wrong, and back that, those judgments up with physical force through coercion. So, I mean, in a sense, what the anarchist faces is, you know, on one hand, anarchy is at best directionlessness, you know, you won't have any kind of purpose unless you have law. And at worst, it's civil strife. But the anarchists didn't actually uh, say that they wouldn't have any law at all, but we'll, we'll come back to that. How did, how did godliness and ungod... We're talking about the 17th century, where the idea of godliness was a, a great defining political uh, fact. How did godliness or ungodliness play in the case of those who could be called anarchists, although the word wasn't commonly used there? Well, I think, you know, the... You know, what you were saying earlier is, is the key to it. Anyone who challenges the orthodoxy of the time is someone who is accused of being anarchist. I'm not sure that it's tied necessarily to godliness. I mean, people like Locke, who are advocating um, you know, mixed government or constitutional monarchy, are denounced as, as people who are uh, leading us towards anarchy simply because they're challenging the orthodoxies. And I think that's the key to it. I mean, later anarchists would say that... 19th century anarchists would, would pick up the point about godliness in terms of saying it's, it's godliness and the idea that we have to subordinate ourselves to some higher authority that lies at the root of the, of the problem, of, the, of the, the fear that unless you have something outside of your, yourself you're going to, to collapse back into some kind of chaotic life. Uh, John Keane indicated in, in his opening uh, overview, really, it, the, 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 the semantic shift occurred in the French Revolution, let's mm. say. These are generalisations, but it's, I hope you think it's reasonably accurate. How did that occur and what did it mean? Well, there's a group of, in, there's a group of um, militants in the French Revolution, um, opponents of the Jacobins, called the Enrage. Uh, so I think it's literally the rabid ones. Um, and they attack the Jacobins for the centralisation of power. And they're taken off to trial in 1793. They don't call themselves anarchists, but they're denounced as anarchists. Um, and the, the, the sort of the, the prosecution focus on the fact that they are seemingly advocating an abandonment of central controls. And I think what's important about... Um, the French Revolution for the, for the later history of anarchism in the 19th century is that the, um, the term is used for the first time in opposition to a mainstream form of socialism, if you mm. like, or there's a, a line of development, at least, that you could trace from the Jacobin uh, French Revolution through to the later Russian Revolution, and the opponents 
the revolutionary opponents of that tendency are claimed to be and later claim themselves to be anarchists. So you could say that from the French Revolution it began to dig itself in as it could almost be called a movement, but certainly a strand. Certainly a strand. Certainly a strand that developed. Uh, Peter Marshall, before we take one step forward, let's take two steps back because I'd like listeners to show... To, to know what you know about, about the fact that it's been bedded in in various ways to the Western tradition long before this. Can you tell us... I'm sorry to go back to the Greasy one. I'm not. Uh, can you tell us what happened there? Yes, I think that, that uh, anarchism is actually very ancient, or what I would rather call the anarchist sensibility. Yes. I think wherever... I mean, the, the state is quite a recent development in, in human experience, and people have le- lived outside the state for... for, 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 for um, Millions, uh, hundreds of years. Longer than they've lived inside the state. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and they've governed themselves and they've, they've run their own affairs very peacefully and cooperatively. But I think that you have, uh, with the Greeks, you have the, the beginnings of the separation between religion and philosophy and people beginning to question authority and to think for themselves. And uh, there is a lively libertarian spirit, I think, that comes through certain Greek philosophers. I mean, the sophists who taught for a fee how to argue well and, <laughs> and, and, and be good at rhetoric. They nevertheless sent off barbs of, of, of wit and, and they had very many challenging ideas of conventional morality. Uh, and then even, even uh, Socrates, who was accused of, of uh, being a sophist, he was, he was an anti-democrat, but he nevertheless believed that an unexamined life was, was not worth living and he was condemned by the Athenian state for corrupting the young. I think even more importantly amongst the Greeks are the, are the, the Cynics uh, and also the Stoics. The Stoics um, believed, they made a distinction between nature and custom, and, and they believed that the one should live according to, to uh, the laws of nature rather than the laws of man. And uh, they, uh, Zeno, they're one of their main exponents, in his Republic, very different to, to the totalitarian one of Plato, um, has a vision of society without property, without government, based on universal brotherhood. So we have that, and we also have it in, 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 in the religions. We see it in... Can you... I'm, I'm sorry to ask you to be brief, but... Yeah. Uh, in, in Christianity, Buddhism, Taoism, briefly, it is there, isn't it? The idea that we... That is not yet called anarchism is around there, too. It is, and it, and it, and it comes through very strongly in, say, 6th uh, century BC China, within Taoism, the Lao Tzu, for instance... Um, pointed out that the more rules and regulations there are, the poorer, poorer people become. The sharper men's weapons, the more trouble in the land. And, that, and he was, the, the Taoist um, were arguing for a society, a decentralised society in harmony with nature. Again, we find in, in Buddhism, uh, although they, there's a stress on community, there's also a belief in autonomy and self-disciplined freedom. And, and one can work out one's own salvation without script, outside scriptures... Uh, and, and, and masters. And then uh, I think in, even more so in Christianity, you quoted at the beginning St. Paul saying that there is no authority except God. The early Christian father, St. Augustine, went even further and said, love and do what you will. And particularly in the Middle Ages, there was millenarian sects who believed there was a second coming of Christ. and They were in a state of grace, the Anabaptists, the, the Hussites, the Brethren of the Free Spirit, they all believed that they, they, they could live, it, since they were in a state of grace, they could live without uh, the government of, 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 of the state or of the church, and, and that they could do no evil. And this comes through actually during the, the uh, English Civil War with the ranters and the diggers. Uh, when Stanley, for instance, Gerald Wynne Stanley, said that all men stand for freedom, for freedom is the man who would turn the world upside down. And they, they wanted to form a common treasury. And God forbid there are even masterless women <laughs> joining in <laughs> with free love and, and rejection of law and government. So that brought us right up to where we left off before that, which is, uh, so up to, how did, we know the Enlightenment is very much, we use the pen is the age of reason, John Keane. How did reason, uh, did reason uh, enable anarchism, which don't the end of the 18th century, begin in the 19th century now, still not named widely, as uh, to, to proceed, did it give it? Did it give it intellectual strength and, and certain respectability there? Yes, I think slightly in contrast to to Peter, I think that um, all that he said is about the antecedents of of modern anarchism. But I think it's rather anachronistic to talk in that way. As such, I mean, the language of anarchism 
only appears under modern conditions around the time of the French Revolution. And there's, in this sense, I think, anarchism is much more born of the pathologies of the modern world, excessive state power, the mm. emphasis on the market, uh, the, the wrecking of nature. And yet it feeds upon uh, some of the central elements of what we call modern life, and one of them is reason. You can see this uh, commitment to reason among the early anarchists in the work of William Godwin, uh, said in the English tradition to be uh, uh, probably the first explicit uh, defender of something like an anarchist uh, vision. And for him, son of a, a parson, uh, born in Wisbeck in Cambridgeshire, uh, a, ver a man uh, 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 wonderfully ascetic, self-disciplined, an embodiment of reason. He thought that all individuals, men and women, he married Mary Wollstonecraft, uh, all men and women are endowed with reason. Probably, in the end, it's God-given. And it should not be abused, taken away by anybody else. Uh, all individuals have the capacity uh, to learn, to, to come closer to truth. And this commitment to uh, sincerity... No butler, said uh, Godwin, should ever lie if uh, his master is in. Uh, this commitment to sincerity, to reason, to truth, is, is, is uh, ultimately for Godwin the justification of the abolition of government. Why should uh, politicians, parties, ministers uh, determine for us how we should live? This uh, instead should be done by means of uh, self-reflection, uh, commitment to truth, sincerity... Uh, listening to public opinion and applying, above all, rules to ourselves, which we ourselves have made. Can we talk a little bit about Ruth Rousseau, Ruth Kinner, who was enormously in influential at the end of the 18th century in his ideas? Did he, did, did he as it were, give more, feed this uh, notion uh, uh, as much as uh, Godwin? Because he was more influential than Godwin. I think that in terms of the attraction that the anarchists yeah. had to Rousseau, I think... Um, what the anarchists like about Rousseau stems from Rousseau's notion of natural freedom. And this is the freedom that Rousseau says we enjoy in the state of nature, mm. uh, the condition he imagines that we lived in prior to the formation of government. And natural freedom is your freedom to secure things in nature, and it's something that you initially enjoy in isolation. Okay, but gradually, Rousseau says, what happens is that you come into contact with others, and for a brief period at least, you can enjoy your... Um, your natural freedom and have sociability. Now, in the long run, Rousseau says, in fact, you can't hang on to natural freedom and once you've lost it, you can't recover it. Um, and so in the ideal form of government, Rousseau recommends that you exchange your natural freedom for what he calls civic freedom, which is the freedom to participate in lawmaking, and moral freedom, which is the, the freedom you enjoy as... Um, part of your, your membership of the community. Now, the anarchists don't like that part of Rousseau, and they're very critical of this, this ideal form of government. But what they do like is the notion that, that there's no necessary trade-off, if you like, between freedom on one hand, sociability on the other, even if you have to, to have you know, certain conditions for that to, to work. And the other thing they like about Rousseau is the story that he tells about the formation of non-ideal government, um, and this story is, is one which points up that government doesn't just happen. It's not a spontaneous sort of evolution. And it's not necessary either in a kind of a Hobbesian sense because we're not all living um, at each other's throats in Rousseau's state of nature. Um, the government that, that develops, that people first enter into, according to Rousseau, is, a, is an imposition. And it's imposed by those people who in the state of nature have... Uh, manage to secure certain advantages for themselves. And what they want to do in government is to maintain those advantages at the cost of, of everybody else. So the anarchist takes from that, I suppose, the idea that, that government is basically exploitative, it's basically oppressive, and it deprives us of something which is extremely valuable, which is our natural freedom. Now, we, uh, we could talk about Tom Paine, we could talk about Blake, we could talk about various people feeding him, but let's get on to the first person who called himself publican, 
anarchist Peter Marshall, uh, Joseph Proudhon, and he's best known for his declaration, Property is Theft. Can you explain uh, why property was at, seems to be at the centre of his uh, philosophy attack and why he was influential and gripped this idea of anarchism and from him, from the time that he got hold of it, as it were, he has been in our politics? Yes, well, in the middle of the 19th century, it, it was uh, Proudhon who did deliberately call himself an anarchist. And he said, I'm, a, I'm a, a strong supporter of order, but I am, in the fullest sense, an anarchist. And that he linked uh, uh, the rejection of government with uh, the rejection of, of exclusive property. So when he asked in his, in his book, what is property, he said property is theft. It's theft because it, it's the, the, the large property owners are taking the surplus um, from the workers themselves and they are not receiving the full fruits of their labour. And as, as such, it is a, an unjust institution. And in its place, he recommended a form of, of what he called mutualism, which is in which uh, people uh, um, set, set up uh, uh, banks with free credit, with trade unions, where they would share... Not unlike cooperative movements. Not, uh, uh, very similar to the cooperative yes. movement. Yeah. Uh, not, not uh, but with, without um, any uh, government, obviously, to... To organise it, and this had a huge influence on, on the 19th century um, uh, working class movement, particularly in France and also in, in Spain and Italy. Uh, Robert Owen, of course, is more influence in, in, in Britain, but um, it was he also took a very very strong uh, dislike of parliamentary politics. He was actually a Republican candidate at the 1848 revolution, and the very experience of being lost, as he called it, in, into this. Uh, Parliamentary Sinai. Uh, meant he, <laughs> thereafter, he declared that the universal suffrage was the counter-revolution, <clears throat> and and uh, he wanted to work uh, with peasants and with uh, the workers uh, to create a more just and equal society, without government and without exclusive property. He eventually he didn't actually reject property in the in the sense of a possession. Um, uh, on a limited basis. In fact, in some ways, he saw it as a bulwark of freedom, but he rejected uh, large-scale um, ownership. Can we then move to Bakunin uh, w with you, uh, John Keane, um, in the sense of what did he bring and add to? We're talking about the middle of the 19th century still. Well, I think of all the 19th century anarchists, uh, uh, Mikhail Bakunin, uh, uh, I think, lived and looked the part. Uh, copious brandy drinker, a uh, huge appetite for reading and food, a uh, great cigar smoker. Apparently in prison in a month in Saxony, he went through 1,600 cigars. Uh, Wild-looking and the great uh, enemy of Karl Marx in the first international, uh, this international uh, working men's association that tried to develop across borders in Europe and beyond solidarity among the emerging working classes. Bakunin's objection... Uh, to Marx and the Marxists. Now, can, does, yes. Is this the best way to define his ideas, through his objection to Marx? I think this is uh, what Bakunin today is remembered for. Yeah. Um, it is the point at which I think the, the, the black splits from the red, that uh, anarchism becomes uh, hostile to what they take, as Bakunin uh, insists, uh, uh, on the authoritarianism of, uh, of Marxian socialism. The, the central dispute that Bakunin has with Marx has to do with this dictatorship of the proletariat idea. So uh, Marx and other socialists and communists uh, have this idea that there will be a transition to socialism and then communism, and it will require self-discipline and administration and government as a, as a transitional device. For Bakunin, that uh, is, uh, if you like, uh, trying to cast out devils with Beelzebub. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's the recipe for a dictatorship over the proletariat. And, of course, Bakunin proved to be right about this, that uh, lurking within uh, Marxian socialism was the possibility of a new kind of political authoritarianism. And this, uh, uh, I think, was a restatement by Bakunin of this... Um, uh, uh, a classic modern anarchist idea that government is the principal enemy of autonomy, of freedom. 
And also, you know, that hierarchy is somehow almost embedded in any social organisation because both Proudhon and Bakunin spotted that Marx was, uh, could be authoritarian, dicta- uh, dictatorial authoritarian. Uh, and they fell out with him. Both of them fell out with him. Could you just... Uh, John's given us, uh, uh, again, a good overview of that, but could we elaborate that a little? This happened at, uh, with Bakunin at the First International where Marx expelled him. Uh, and so it's, the fight is coming very much into the ideas which are, which are beginning to shape the modern world. Uh, can we just elaborate that a bit more? Yeah, certainly. Uh, the, um, I, mean, I think that the, the essential um, difference between Bakunin and Marx comes in the con- conception of the state. Um, and Bakunin sort of accepts quite a lot of what Marx says. Uh, he accepts the idea that the state is an instrument of class rule, so... Um, which means basically that whoever happens to have political power, decisions are always made in the interests of those who have the economic power, so the property owners and the shareholders and so forth. Um, Bakunin thinks that's right, but that you can't explain all forms of domination or oppression by exploitation or by class, so that there are other things like patriarchy or racism, for example, that aren't reducible to economic exploitation. Or religion, he brings Or religion. He, or certainly he talks about religion yeah. and, and religious intolerance and this sort of thing. Um, and Marx's system is too narrow in that sense uh, because he's only looking at class exploitation. The other problem that the P- Bakunin has with Marx is that Bakunin believes that there's an organisational element uh, or dimension to the state which Marx entirely misses... And that organisational element is tied to what Bakunin calls authority, the idea that we must subordinate ourselves to others, that we must obey commands, uh, that we must do as we're told, pretty much. And so, in a practical sense, the problem that Bakunin has is that Marx's um, strategy for the transition from capitalism to socialism relies on the working class coming in and seizing political power and using the machinery of the state, so government and the army and so forth, to force through the economic changes that will form the basis for socialism, so collectivising the land and um, abolishing the market, whatever it happens to be. And Bakunin says, well, that's that's all very well as far as it goes, but what you're not addressing is all those other forms of exploitation or oppression that might exist, so you might still have a sexist society or a, a patriarchal society. And... Even worse, what you're doing, although you only have one class now, which is the, the, the working class, um, you've got a division between those who are in a position to make decisions and everybody else who has to do as they're told. So you might have an equal society, but you don't have a free one. In a sense, what Bakunin is saying is, is it's the animal farm scenario, that everyone's equal, but some people are more equal than others. Can we just pause for one second before we move on to... Uh, on to- Kropotkin, because I want to keep him for a minute or two. But can you just give us some idea, Peter Marsh? We're talking about these in Bakunin, um, Proudhon, Marx, middle of the 19th century, ferments, revolutions, and so on. How is it spreading out into uh, uh, what is happening in the politics and organisation of, let us say, West European society? At that? Can you just give us some view on that before we move on? Well, I think, I think was, we, we haven't mentioned the Paris Commune of, yeah. of 1871. Uh, where there were many Proudhonists involved and uh, followers of Bakunin, and uh, but that that cast a sort of shadow over, if you like, the um, the bourgeoisie of Europe, and that they saw the tremendous threat of of uh, anarchism and socialism, working class anarchism and socialism, and a, a, a period of great a, 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 um, repression followed, um, and it was during that. But during that period, the, that particularly Bakunin had a very strong influence in the working class. They started to organise what was been called anarcho-syndicalism, so revolutionary syndicalism, which again rejected the Marxist, um, an authoritarian socialist approach, to the conquest of power, and they believed the union itself would form a, a, a cell... Uh, an embryo in in the new society of the new but society. But how wide, Sorry to press yes, you on yes. this. But how wise? Where is this happening? Well, this, how big the, the, is it? And yes. What influence does it have? Well, this had a this had a very wide influence in in, in France and particularly in Italy, and and also in uh, Spain, which of course uh, in the twentieth century became the the great um, 
It had the great anarchist experiment of all time. So the ideas are going directly through to people, as it were, let's say, on the ground. Yes, they are, and, 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 and also in Germany and Switzerland becomes a, 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 a hotbed of, of anarchism where, where Bakunin goes and, and also uh, Kropotkin. John? Yes, I, I agree with that, and I, I think the traditions of friendly societies, of cooperatives, the, the birth of trade unions are uh, fundamentally bound up with this anarchist sensibility if not outright anarchism. But it should also be remembered there's another side, another face of anarchism in the 19th century and its assassination. Uh, Tsar Alexander II, bumped off in 1881. McKinley, 1896. I mean, there were great controversies about whether this was the fault of anarchism, but the point is there was a tendency within late 19th century anarchism to pick up the gun, to deal directly with political power, and in that sense, it made uh, it, it it had its presence. Ruth, yeah, I was just going to say that one of the ways that the anarchists get their message across is by setting up newspapers. And from the eighteen seventies onwards, you have a range of um, anarchist press, uh, which have a you know quite a wide circulation. And so the ideas are getting out to workers through the networks of, of press, which are either um, sold openly in countries like Britain, um, or are smuggled through to. Uh, states like Russia. Uh, and so anarchist ideas do get directly to the people themselves. One of those pe uh, persons who ran a newspaper is, is the, one of the, uh, another great figure, perhaps one of the greatest figures in some people's eyes, of anarchism is Prince Peter Kropotkin. Um, he was widely read across Europe. Oscar Wilde described him as a new Christ coming out of Russia. Um, he advocated mutual aid and, and, and based some of his ideas on a, a deep reading of Darwin, talking mm. about Darwin's cooperative, cooperative elements and the later Darwin, which a lot of Darwinists uh, don't, don't face up to these days. Uh, and he was very influential. He was exiled from Russia, escaped, came and stayed a lot of time here, run papers. And, can you put him in place and then we can talk about what happens in the 20th century? Peter. Yes, well, Kropotkin's a key figure. He, of course, was a, um, a communist that we proved on was a, a mutualist. We had Bakunin, who was a collectivist. So Kropotkin did believe in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, the possessions being in a common pool. But he, he was a geographer uh, and also a prince and also a one-time page to the Tsar of Russia. But when he left uh, Russia because of his revolutionary interest and in, went into exile... He, he um, as a geographer and, and an early ecologist, he was very interested in, in, in Darwinian evolution and, and argued that cooperation rather than competition was a, a key element in, in uh, evolution. And, Sorry, not to you. Well, I was say, and, 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 uh, and, and, and so mutual aid was something which was very, very much part of the human experience. And human beings, by their very nature, um, through evolution, had developed a moral sense Mm. which meant that that external laws and imposed authority was no, no longer necessary. Ruth, can you develop that? Because what Kropotkin seems to be saying very clearly and, and, and in a way that attracted a lot of people is that people left on their own without government can manage not only well, which is the opposition, to, uh, um, but they can do it on a moral basis, they can, they can do it successfully in all sorts of ways. Can you just take that on? Well, the way it works in, in the, the context of, of Kropotkin's... Um, theory of Darwin, or it's his interpretation of Darwin, is to say that um, is to try and rescue, if you like, Darwin from social Darwinists, uh, from people like T.H. Huxley, who believe that um, what Darwin has described in the struggle for existence is something that equates to the survival of the fittest, where fitness is defined in terms of uh, the individual's capacity to compete for scarce resources. And as Peter said, I mean, what, what Kropotkin says is that there's another way in which you can interpret fitness, and that's the ability of species to cooperate to protect themselves against the environment, against predators and, and so forth. And Kropotkin's concern is, is not only to say that, you know, therefore Darwin is describing a... a, a um, a nature which is more Rousseauian, if you like, than it is Hobbesian, but that he wants to counter the claim that T.H. That Huxley makes, which is that because nature is red in tooth and claw, you can't find the source of moral reason from within nature. What Kropotkin says is that, you know, once you, once you understand that Darwin has a, a, a wider understanding of struggle, uh, 
you can look at anthropological evidence and you can look at historical evidence and you can see the way in which humans have come together and developed deliberately um, ethical codes, codes of mutual aid and support. And what Kropotkin wants to do then is say, well, you know, if this is what humans do by their own volition, then what we should do as anarchists is find ways of uh, structuring society in ways that will allow mutual aid to flourish. And that's where the communism comes in. That's the best form of society, Kropotkin argues, to allow mutual aid to develop. John Keane, so at the, by the beginning of the century, anarchism is very much on, on the political agenda. Can you tell us how it worked its way through, say, the first um, uh, couple of decades of the 20th century? What impact, what influence it has, how it threaded its way into the political discourse? Well, a continuation uh, from below of uh, self-organisation of workers, uh, the labour movement, uh, in some areas uh, creating, some parts of the world creating tremendous effects. Uh, think of the Wobblies uh, in the United States, the IWW, uh, with uh, their heroes, Joe Hill, uh, hanged by the neck in the state of Utah in 1915, uh, stood, a, stood against the struggle for the franchise, uh, stood against uh, government, and particularly World War... I mean, the eve of World War I, I think, is a period of great flourishing of anarchist and anarcho-syndicalist ideas and, and actions, direct a uh, action. Uh, there is, um, as well, I think, the, what's interesting about anarchism is that it could be, it could be seen, I think, as, as, as the ideas, as the language, as the style of the losers of the modern world. And it partly explains why uh, anarchism took root in the countryside. So the Ukraine, uh, Catalo uh, uh, Catalonia, Andalusia... Uh, so there begins to be this uh, this bite of uh, of anarchism within the uh, the rural areas, and I think this resonates, uh, for example, with the way that Ruth has spoken about uh, Kropotkin and this 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 rural uh, uh, element. Can so, I use this uh, as an excuse to well, as a anyway? Can I get to the anarchist movement in Spain in the Civil War, which a lot of our listeners will know about through Orwell's homage to Catalonia, very closely observed, and uh, there you are. Now it, it was. Perhaps the biggest experiment. Uh, it, it was in many ways very successful. Can you briefly tell us how successful it was and how big it was in the context of the Spanish Civil War, Peter Marshall? Well, it was extraordinarily successful and the greatest experiment so far. And uh, the, the anarcho-syndicalism was a very strong force in Spain. And that at the time of, of the, when Franco rebelled against the elected um, Popular Front government in 1936... That there were one and a half million members in, in the um, in the anarchist uh, syndicalist movement, and uh, as soon as the revolution, um, the, the, as soon as the re Franco's rebellion took off, that he occupied his forces occupied half the country, then the the, uh, the anarchists uh, in in both in the south and in Catalonia st started to organise themselves, and over three million uh, people in Andalusia and in the east in, in Levant organised agricultural communes. They, they, um, they even were calling for abolishing money and, and uh, there was practising vegetarianism, nudism. There was a huge... Abolition uh, of coffee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> free love as well. Women and men equal. There's a, this is a three million people engaged in this. And then I think slightly in disagreement with you that it wasn't just merely a rural movement, that in Catalonia was the most highly advanced industrial part of Spain at the time. 70% of industry was there. And it was in, in, the, in the factories, they, they set themselves up through workers' control and self-management, and even hostile historians have accepted that they actually increased production. So you both see, both in agricultural areas and industrialised areas of Spain, an enormous uh, and successful anarchist experiment taking place. Ruth, can we just develop about one more thing? I mean, Peter said it, it, they increased production, uh, and it, it basically, in that area, it worked. Would you agree with that? And if so, why did it get crushed? First of all, why do you, would you, do you want to Did develop it work? I mean, it, well, I, I think it increased production in certain areas. I don't think it's, you know, it's not a, a universal success. I think the important thing about Spain and Barcelona is that the, the anarchists demonstrate that they can do stuff that everybody said they couldn't, which was run certain industries um, by themselves and that, you know, syndicalism had worked in that sense. I don't think you could say it was a universal success, but then, you know, they are working in a wartime 
um, situation. And you know, the, the reasons for the for the collapse of the experiment have as much to do with the kind of the international politics of the time as they do about with the. Um, well, mostly to do with Germany and Mussolini and the fact that we didn't go there for one thing. Exactly. Well, quite, and the fact that they, they were also confronted with the Stalinists and, and, mm. and all of that. So, you know, there are reasons for the collapse of, of, of the, the experiment which extend way beyond what the, the cooperative venture itself mm. could do. When I say we, I mean, the, the, I mean various individuals went, <laughs> a great number of individuals went, but the, the British government had a chance to intervene and totally change the course of 20th century history as we moved in then, I think. A lot of people more knowledgeable than I think that as well. You're trying to get in. Well, people. I certainly agree. I mean, uh, 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 Germany and Italy sent, you know, weapons. They sent, they sent uh, uh, tanks and, and aircraft and men to fight on, on Franco's side. France and, and Britain refused to send arms or support, although, of course, many... Britons lost their lives in, in the um, Republican brigades. But the, 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 the source of weapons was from Russia, and although the Communist Party um, by that time, Stalinist, was, was, uh, had, had a, a small um, grouping in uh, Catalonia, they controlled the weapons, and in the end they, they were fearful, just as the, the Lenin had been fearful of, 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 of the anarchists during the Russian Revolution, they were fearful of their influence. And and they ended up as a shootout between between the anarchists and, and the communists. Where did that leave the anarchists? Where has that left the anarchists? As the big experiment it didn't fail, was was crushed, overcome, forced by year, John Keane. Finally, where did it leave them? Where has it left the anarchism? Well, we still see the the A in a circle splashed on walls. Uh, I I like to think of this anarchist sensibility, as Peter has put it, as rather like uh, streams that have gone underground uh, since uh, since 45, since this great European civil war war in in Spain, which the anarchists lost. You can s some of some of this is surprise would be surprising for 19th century anarchists. I think. Uh, the strong commitment to uh, market liberalism is, is a carrier of, of some of those, however perversely, of those anarchist sentiments. Art. Think of Bunuel and Kafka and modernism and postmodernism. The spirit of anarchism is strongly uh, uh, there. I think the revival of interest in civil society, beginning with the civil rights movement in America, the, the Sitians, you know, sitting in in Woolworths in defence of the right of black people to, to, to be equals with, with white. And I would say, finally, this spirit of, of anarchism is alive and well and increasingly important in the whole revival of ecological politics. Thank you very much. Thanks, Peter Marshall, John Keane and Ruth Kinner. Uh, next week we'll be talking about Indian mathematics and the origin of our numerals today. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast. You can find hundreds of other programmes about history, science and philosophy at bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4.